welcome to to everyone. Um, it's just so good to see familiar and unfamiliar um, names popping up on the screen. And if you are new to this space, a very big, 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 big welcome. Um, but before we actually even start today's topic, um, we just, I thought maybe just to take, you know, some few moments um, of silence just to stand in solidarity with the woman in Afghanistan. Um, I think we all know what is happening there. And, you know, the usual, um, the news are starting to frizzle out of the media, but knowing that they're still, you know, um, yeah, the situation is rapidly deteriorating. And yeah, so just maybe just to take some few seconds just to pay respect and think of all the women that are stuck um, in Afghanistan. Cool, thank you. And I mean, it, it's so incredible that we are closing the South African Women's Month, you know, just highlighting and talking about women in history. And this morning, I couldn't really help to think of my own grandmother, you know, who I'm now learning through stories on how phenomenal she was, you know, like I recently learned that, you know, we used to have a soup kitchen in our house and um, she used to bring in like random strangers, you know, people that didn't have shelter, people that didn't have food. So our home was was always you know, welcome. And I couldn't help but think of like how many women, you know, are undocumented or are not given the title of like heroes or activism that are constantly giving every single day, every single second, even to this day. I mean, in Cape Town, it's raining, it's cold. And I know that there are some homes who are currently flooding and probably there is a woman in that house who is trying to make sure that, you know, the kids are sheltered, um, the kids are warm, the kids are fed. So it's such an honor to really be taking this time today just to really highlight and deconstruct and really talk about what does it mean, you know, to be an activist um, as a woman. So, yeah. So, um, Gabriel, can we, are you going to share this the slide? Um, I don't have access to it, but if Michelle, oh, um, Michelle, able to send, I can Michelle, share. Michelle is going to do it. And of course, um, I mean, I've got my. <laughs> there's Michelle also, um, my side buddy. <laughs> Michelle, do you want to <laughs> say hi? <laughs> hi, everyone. Uh, I'm going to share the slide in two seconds. Oh. Aha, and we're live. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Michelle. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, so let's let's begin. Um, yeah, so basically today is really about looking into women and history. Um, also, since we are closing the Women's Month in South Africa, we're just going to be going back and looking at the origins of the Women's Month in South Africa, where it came from, why, and why we we're still celebrating that um, day even to this day. Yeah. So before we start, we're just going to go over some house rules. So um, because it's a virtual space, we're not... Um, you know, in a workshop, physical workshop together. Um, so if you look at the bottom of your screen, there are a lot of icons and things there, but I think the last one, um, it's called reaction. And if you click on reaction, there are a lot of emojis and one of them is raise hand. So if you, um, at any time of the workshop, you are not sure, you don't understand what they're saying, or you have a question, you are so welcome to use that icon, raise hand please. Um, and we will give you space for that. Um, also, um, this is a learning space, which means that we are all learning, including me and Michelle. Um, 
hence it's called back to basic because we have identified um, through ACA that you know we, we go into these activism spaces um, and sometimes there are these huge concepts and huge words you know that are used that often left this feeling because um, we just don't understand so hence we have this space where we really go back to basic so again with that being said the words the language that we'll be using this space will be very simple <laughs> it will be really basic um yeah and i mean because we are human beings sometimes we might throw in a big word unintentionally please again raise your hand remind us ask that question pause um, make us pause to really um make us aware so that we can define what that word means um yeah and sometimes some people feel shy to engage during the session but if you feel activated and you have some questions or you or you have some thoughts or maybe an idea of a conversation please don't be afraid to reach out to us we will post our contact details on the chat um before the workshop um end um also we we really encourage um inclusivity so um i know that there are a lot of us who are so used to this space um unintentionally we'll, we'll be more comfortable you know to answer to engage um so we always like to remind people of this rule of three or rule of two so um and basically what it means is that if you have asked a question or made a comment you wait for two people you know to say something and then you can then engage again so that we give space um, for those who don't necessarily feel brave you know to to ask or to engage so yeah so we really gonna practice the rule of two okay and before we start um we're just gonna do a centering exercise because um it's the end of the day you know there's a lot has happened um and sometimes often like we come into spaces with bringing in our whole day and it's sometimes just very nice to pause and reflect and just breathe you know because it's so funny and i always say like you know breath is one thing that keeps us alive but it's also one thing that we don't take note of so um as we are about to start our workshop um we just like to remind you that you do have the breath and the breath keeps us alive but also breath is one thing that can really bring us into the present moment so that we can fully be present and take in you know what is being shared in the space so if you feel comfortable you might close your eyes or maybe take a gaze take your gaze down or stay at one thing and this is just for concentration and to focus And maybe you must just like relax your shoulders, relax your jaw, have a gentle smile on your face because that relaxes your whole face. And then together we're going to take a breath in. Breathing out. So as you breathe out, just letting go of your day, you know, letting go of the thoughts. And seeing if you can bring yourself into this moment as we enter safety and a learning space. So if you are back with us, maybe you might post some emoji so that we can feel your presence and see that you're still with us since this is a visual space. Okay, so we're gonna move on to the next slide. Michelle, do you want to take this one? I still struggle with finding the unmute button. Um, just making sure that everyone can hear me well. Um, so we all come from a woman, right? Like we all do. And I'm probably going to start this exercise 
Um, so feel free to raise your hand and answer the question or put it in the chat, whatever is most comfortable to you. Um, and naming a woman in history who has inspired me is always a very interesting question um, because I just feel like there have been so many women um, and particularly like women who have like the line of women where I come from, my mom, my grandma, my grandmothers, both of them. Um, and in fact, let's start there. Um, both grandmothers from mom and dad's side have been so inspirational to me in that both of them um, were very involved in making things out of nothing. Like my grandmother from my dad's side were, would make um, these mats with plastic bags and she would always be busy with her crocheting hook and she'd be doing all of this and all of that and she used to make these clay pots which were so beautiful and my grandmother she's late now but my mom's mother um she's constantly making new things like now she's made temperature bags there's another name for it but you essentially put your pot of food inside and then it keeps hot or cold or it can actually finish your cooking for you um, and that's just been very very inspirational and then when we look more on the freedom fighters revolutionary front um, you would look for me my personal inspiration would be mama winnie madikizela mandela she's just been amazing um, she had been so incredible um, and Women's Month, what it means to me is like a chance to speak up without the noise of everything else that normally happens during the year. Um, so a part of me really feels like Women's Month is important in that sense. And I think I've already answered who my hero is. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's like my grandparents, my mom, like the line of women that I come from and like the regular women that I come in contact with every other day, that person is my hero because they're constantly evolving and doing new things and just existing, which is like incredible. Um, so if you would like to go next and do this exercise, um, let us know. Um, you can pop your hand up. Um, um. Hi, everybody. Um, a woman who has inspired me in history. Um, I, I can't say it's like, it's all women. But in a way, I can't say that there's necessarily been a single one. But rather, the mobilizations that have moved forward. Um, you know, and that's kind of what Women's Month means to me, is honoring the actions of women who, even though they are, you know, at most risk uh, and at, you know, most vulnerable uh, in different communities, they are still the ones fighting for not only themselves, but first and foremost others. And so that is why I can't just say one. Um, but if I have to say one, I would say my late grandmother. Um, but there's so many other women who have played a pivotal role in the way that I view life. Um, so that is what I would say. And I don't want to nominate anyone, but if anyone is free to speak, please go for it. Or use the chat if you're more comfortable. So you can raise your hand if you'd like to, to go next. We'll give you a minute um, or you can type in the chat box and then maybe uh, Muketwa, please go ahead. Hello everyone. A woman who has inspired me is Tapo Mutipe. She has contributed to the poverty and, and education of, of young people by investing in it. Uh, Woman Month to me is acknowledging all the women that exist on this earth 
and my hero has to be my own grandmother. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that, Mketwa. Um, would anyone else want to go next? Yes, Petras, please go. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, so a woman in history that inspires me. I'm also like Gabriel. I can't really think of a single one, um, but definitely my mother and my grandmother. I think just looking at the way they've grown up and the circumstances that they lived in, knowing that they have persevered and sort of come out of those situations and not only gotten themselves out of those situations, but um, their families and not just their immediate families, but um, their communities and the way they've um, impacted them, that inspires me. Um, I think of Black trans women as well. I think of Marsha P. Johnson, um, who started the, or yeah, literally led the Stonewall riots and um, the bravery that takes. Um, what Women's Month means to me is dedicating a time to human beings that are really left out of important conversations, human beings who've been subjugated, who've been put down, but have always been at the forefront of every movement, have always been at the forefront of um, whatever revolution is around, but never get the credit that um, they are due. So Women's Month is just a time for us to honor the work of women, the, the work that they have done, the work that they continue doing. And a hero for me um, would be my mother and my grandmother, my late grandmother, and then women all around, just honestly, your the existence, just simply existing, um, daring to um, speak up and be present in, in, in places that don't want you there, in places that continue to tell you that you're not good enough or that your voice doesn't matter. Women, simply by existing, they're saying, no, we exist, we deserve a space and you'll respect us regardless. So yeah, a hero to me is women everywhere. Thank you. That's amazing. Thank you so much for sharing that, Petrus. Um, is there anyone else who would like to go next? Remember, this is your space too, just as much as it is ours. Yeah, I also, what came up for me was my late mother, um, who just was a massive inspiration for me and teaching me to, to care for myself and, and for others and also the world around us. And I guess Women's Month for me shines a light really on how thankful and grateful that I am to the women who've come before us who've really been central to bringing us more equality, more human rights, progress, inventions, all kinds of things. Um, and, you know, how we have to keep on trying to, to kind of make the world better um, in the wake of their progress. And a woman who really came up for me today, well, the first that came to my mind, and there are many, is Mum Fukile and Shangase, who was a mother, grandmother and community leader. And she, she gave her life, I mean, her life was taken from her, but fighting for the social environmental rights of her community here in South Africa. Um, and she's an incredibly inspiring and strong woman. Um, and I also just think of her today and the sacrifices that she made. Thank you, Sarah. Um, yeah, wow. <laughs> Uh, maybe I could go, Michelle. Yeah. Uh, so for me, yeah, I'm also finding it very difficult to choose one specific woman because um, I feel like there's been a tribe of women who have been behind my success, behind my career, um, and they inspire me all the time, every day, even to this day. And what Women's Month means to me is just really just honoring um, women who have been, you know, paving this 
path of women having a voice in South Africa and occupying spaces that were mainly occupied by males. And yeah, just honoring and celebrating women. And my hero, I think I spoke about it in my intro, like my grandmother is definitely my hero. Uh, but also, I also said in my intro that there are a lot of women, you know, like who um, are not given the titles of being heroes or sheroes. Um, and I and, and those people that are fighting the struggle, you know, behind the scenes, people that are struggling to make means, you know, to feed their families. For me, those are my everyday heroes. Yeah. And we can Thank move you. to the next slide. Yeah. <laughs> I was just thinking the same. Yes. Okay. So basically, if you look at this picture, you would realize that women have always risen, you know, and even to this day, women are rising and women will always rise, you know, like, cause we, um, we are fighters, we are naturers, we are carers, um, we are givers. So it's in our nature to really um, rise and, and, and continue rising. Oh, before we move on, we've got Nzika, uh, who just wrote something that I would just like us to read. Um, so like I said, a woman that inspires inspires me would, uh, let me read that again. A woman that inspires me would, um, the woman around me that strive to do better and be better, people like the story. Oh, Ayaka, Michelle, my auntie and my English teacher. Thank you, Ntika. Thank you so much. That is so sobering. Thank you, Nsika. <laughs> okay. So, I mean, this again is based on the context of South Africa. I guess I want to acknowledge that we do have young people who are not necessarily from South Africa who will be watching this. Um, and so I just, maybe sending apologies that we are basing all of this um, information today on um, South African context. So, I mean, as I said, we we'll really wanted to go back. So um, there's one slogan that has became really um, dominant um, surrounding the Women's Month, you know, the slogan of like, and I think, you could go anywhere in South Africa and say that slogan and everybody would know that that is associated with Women's Day. And probably might be wondering like, where does that come from really? And it really comes from the courage and strength, you know, that from the woman that stood up in 1956 um, to protest against apartheid and just really like coming together as women in resistance for the evil society, you know, that we live in. So um, South Africa has a very painful past, I think we all know, you know, and it's very unfortunate that to this day, I mean, we are now in 2021, um, we are still seeing the residue of that past and some of that past acting, act like in acting. Uh, and so therefore it is up to us to really forge a better and a safer South Africa for all those we live in so that in 10 years to come, in five years to, to come, we don't keep going back and say, hey, that used to happen in the past and it's still happening today. Yeah. So some background. Yeah, so as I said, Women's Month was really declared um, as a tribute to the 20,000 plus, you know, women in 1956 who marched to the union buildings. And the march was really um, to protest against the past laws being extended to women. And these past laws prevented the travel of black South Africans without an internal passport. So back in the days, you know, now we have the freedom to travel wherever we want. Like I can 
no, just think, hey, I want to go to Joburg and board on a flight and go without any issues. I can wake up one day and think, hey, I want to visit family in, in um, Pretoria and I will be able to do that. But back in the days, it was very difficult, you know, to, to travel and women specifically needed like an internal passport. It was called a dumpus back in the days. Um, so these women thought like, hey, like the situation doesn't make sense. Um, actually, let's just gather all forces. Let's gather women and stand up together and go march um, to the union buildings and stand up for ourselves to protest against this past law. So the past law was established to maintain actually the population segregation so to control the urbanization and manage um, migrant lovers during apartheid era. So they really like, I mean, it was, the movement was not free as it is today. Okay. Michelle, do you wanna add anything? No, I think you've said it. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> sorry. So before this, like women have been silent, you know, for too long in our history books. Um, I think if we can all go back to history, we'll see that there are really huge gaps in our knowledge on the role that the, as the South African women have played, you know, in the apartheid era. And, and so when these women, you know, stood up and marched to the Union building, it really was to show bravery because um, back in the day, they could be arrested i mean even to this day they could be arrested you know um they actually risk being detained which is very different to now how people today are being detained they risk um um beatings you know they also risk um being banned you know when they wanted to to go in exile so really there this was really just yeah, they, they, these women were very brave. They were courageous and carried a lot of strength. And, and if you look at this picture, I mean, these were just ordinary women, you know, a woman that you will see down the street. As you see, like there's a mama there with the baby back. It's just ordinary women who actually saw that the system was not from them. And instead of just keeping quiet and continuing with life, decided, hey, actually, let's rally other women because together they knew that they carried um, a strong voice and stood up and stood against this law. Yeah. So if we look at today, you know, like the importance of, of that day, you know, and I want to go back to that slogan of like what Tinda Abafaz, what Tinda Mogoda, which means you strike a woman, you strike a rock, you know. And I've been reading on social media, um, especially the, 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 the young generation saying like, there's something wrong with that statement, you know, because basically what um, it has entailed is that women are strong, women, women, are, women are resilient. And, and so we can withstand all the injustices, you know, towards women. Now, if we're looking at the GBV, you know, women are being killed every second, every minute. And, and if we go back to that slogan, something doesn't really fit in because I, myself, I don't see myself as a rock. No, I am not strong. Because also it contradicts, you know, the, the she, the feminine energy. Because if you look at women, yes, we are strong, we are resilient, but we are also... We are also soft, you know, we, we are also fragile. We are also vulnerable and that doesn't take away our power, you know, to, to stand up for ourselves, our power to occupy these spaces, our power to, to mobilize and to, and to really hold government accountable. So the importance of Women's Month, you know, today, is really focusing their attention to the challenges that the African woman still face, you know, such as parenting, you know, domestic violence that I've spoken about, 
sexual harassment, inequal, um, unequal payment. And you'll be so surprised, you know, even in 2021, there's still huge payment gaps between male and, and females. And also like making sure that all of our girls have um, quality education. So today, Women's Month really sees government's attempts to really push back the issues and plan to address these issues because we can't keep continuing, you know, um, with with all of these, you know, you know, we can't keep continue actually if we are still being threatened. Our lives are threatened every day, and we are still not paid according to our skills and experiences, you know, our girls don't have quality education. So it is said that because of the public holiday, which is on the 9th of August, um, there have been many significant advances, you know. So from 2.7% representation in parliament before 1994, now we have 48% uh, representation throughout the country. Um, so yeah, now we're seeing more and more women taking up spaces, being in parliament. I mean, back in the days, we even have a deputy president who was um, who was female. Um, so the National Women's Day really borrows heavily from the principles of the International Women's Day that has similar goals in terms of the freedom and rights of women. And I'm wondering while Michelle is still um, sorting out the slide, you know, because um, for me that that slogan "What Tinder Buffers, What Tinder Bavato" is such a fascinating um, slogan, and it's been incredible how it's kind of like revolving. You know, the meaning of it is like totally revolving. So I'm wondering if how you guys feel about that slogan. You know, um, as a man, as a human being, as a girl, as a woman, um, you know, when you hear that slogan of like what Tinta Bafazi, what Tinta what what comes into your mind, you know? And you are welcome to use the chat for that, or you can also raise your hand because again, this is a learning space. We also want it to be interactive. I just don't want to be talking all the time on the show. Yeah, we want to hear your voices also. Um this yes idea that women I mean if we look at history yes women have been resilient they've been strong if we look at um, the way things move today women prove show every day with um, all the circumstances and all the things that they've been through that they can be strong and they are resilient however it does create this expectation for women especially black women and women of color to be these pillars of support to be these people that get communities out of um, their struggles or they, they're the ones expected to start these revolutions. Or besides that, they're the ones who are expected to take pain and to, to carry all this suffering and turmoil um, on behalf of their communities and on behalf of themselves. This expectation that women can't um, break down, that women can't be vulnerable, women can't be, um, can't, aren't justified in um, complaining about being treated unfairly or being treated unjustly because no, you're, you're a woman, you're supposed to be strong, you're supposed to take this. It creates this um, vicious cycle of just um, oppression where women aren't it's like they they kind of become gaslit in a in a sense because you're yes you're you're feeling this pain you're feeling um, this um, the struggle you want to change but everyone around you is telling you we've gone through it we've we've dealt with it you can do it we expect you to do it you're a black woman take hold take hold of that power and utilize that power and on one hand it's yes do that because you are strong, you are resilient. However, it doesn't allow women the space to, to simply exist and not have this expectation that they have to be strong, that they have to be courageous, that they have to be at the forefront and they have to be the one carrying the baton. It, it just, it, it, it dehumanizes women to an extent because it, it puts them on this pedestal, it puts them on this, um, it, put them, it puts them at a higher level 
of expectation than everyone else and that's just simply unfair and i think especially for uh women and um femme presenting people growing up having that put on them is not it's not a healthy way to grow up because you you start internalizing all these all this rhetoric and um it becomes destructive so yeah i think the the saying has great intent but it there needs to be more nuance in in that conversation thank you so much petrus yeah well um yeah, we will be looking at some of those assumptions and misconceptions, you know, later on when we speak about the now, you know, is we are a youth led movement, also have women, you know, what does it mean, you know, as a young black woman in this space, you know, what is expected from you, what is, um, yeah, so we're really going to be looking at that. So thank you so much for bringing that up. I know that there were other hands that I didn't really catch. So if you had your hand up, please feel free to unmute yourself and share. I think that maybe mine would be the next. Um, I was just waiting to see if there would be anyone else who had their hand raised. Um, yeah, I just also feel like it solidifies the notion of silencing women's struggles. Um, apart from, you know, it being well-meaning, it is also like, oh, but women are great and like, revolutionaries and freedom fighters and like are we going to continue fighting for freedom or are we going to get to a point where we live within freedom without having to fight and wrestle for it um yeah i think that's that's what it also means for me um i just give like 10 more seconds for anyone else who had something to say before we move on to the next slide. Okay. Um, and so. I see Tiny's you know, got a ah, hand up. Yes, Sorry, please. Michelle. It's okay. <laughs> Feel free, Taiji. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> um, I'm still thinking out loud, but I've been really resonating with what everyone's been saying. And it's really made me think because I had not um, kind of thought of it from that perspective. And I feel as if, yes, it is like uh, it's well-meaning, um, but then the other side of that is like there needs to be like um uh, like also this idea that women are having to take that responsibility to be revolutionary and to carry the community because like men are i don't know if the word is failing or like what the word is but they're not um contributing as much to society and it's strange because men are also, there's a lot of like uh, pressure for men to be like the leader and stuff. But, but that pressure I think is also what's making them fail. Um, these gender roles and these, these ideas that um, you're supposed to, if you're a man or if you're a woman, you're supposed to be a leader or a follower or that kind of idea. So um i kind of feel like we should move beyond that those roles and everyone regardless of their gender should be contributing as much as women are to society um yeah absolutely thank you very much for that um although you were thinking out loud that was a very very we needed to hear that so thank you 
Um, and then Gabriel says, we always talk about women being strong against injustice, yet not discussing the perpetrators of the injustice instead. Um, and this is a very, very wild, widespread problem where it now turns to uh, like victim blaming and all other problems that we see um, when the focus is put on a woman, particularly in instances of gender-based violence. So thank you so much um, for those contributions. They've, they've, they have me thinking now. Um, <laughs> and I'm kind of thinking whether we should just dwell on this for a little bit or um, we'll probably have another one of these where we just really go in depth about all of these um, different issues that definitely need a platform and to be spoken about. Um, and so with that, um, I think it's also important to just realize that the leaders, like the revolutionaries, the activists, are ordinary people who, who come from ordinary experiences who are just fighting for their right to exist. Um, and so with that, we go in to investigate the leaders of the march of um, 1956. And just really know and see that these people were just as regular as we are. And they caused such change to the point where we celebrate Women's Month in addition to Women's Day. Um, and the first leader of the match we are going to look at is Lillian Ngoy, who was a politician and anti-apartheid activist. Um, she was trialed for treason and also became the president of the ANC, as we know it today, Women's League. She joined the ANC during the 1950 defiance campaign and was arrested for using facilities in a post office that were reserved for white people. I mean, we know that this was a problem at like during that time. A lot of countries were also going through this um, intense segregation where certain things couldn't be used by certain people, movie houses, beaches. You couldn't go there because they were reserved for certain people. And she was just such an amazing person um, who was gifted as a public speaker as well. And because of this, she was able to gain traction and actually have people notice her. Um, and eventually became the president of the ANC Women's League. And when the Federation of South African Women was formed in 1954, she became its national vice president until 1956 when she was elected president of the same organization. Um, this is a bit of a um, lot, but I'm just going to quickly go through it. Um, we're still on Lillian Goy, and she gained wide recognition overseas as a radical opponent of apartheid. Um, we had other women like Dora, who she was arrested with while trying to board a ship on her way to a conference in Switzerland without a passport. And she addressed protest meetings against apartheid in a number of world centers, including London's Trafalgar Square. On the 9th of August, um, together with other women like Helen Joseph, Rahima Musa, and Sophia Williams. This was in 1956. They led the Women's Anti-Pass March to the Union buildings in Pretoria. And it's, be, it's been deemed one of the largest demonstrations staged in South African history, but also one very, very important um, historical moment, which has carved parts of society as we know it today. In December of 1956, she was arrested for high treason. Like we mentioned, she was put on trial for treason and along with other 156 leading figures. And she stood trial until 1961. So this was a very long trial um, as she was being accused in the four year long treason trial. While the trial was still on and accused out on bail, Ngoy was imprisoned for five more months under the 1960 state of emergency, where she spent much of this time in solitary confinement. The next leader that we want to look at is Helen Joseph, um, who was a teacher and a social worker, political activist, 
political prisoner, banned person, trade unionist, founder, member of the Congress of Democrats. So this is a very, very lengthy bio. But I just want us to be drawn again to just how ordinary these women were. Helen was a teacher and a social worker. She obviously was labeled a political activist because of the work that she was doing and because of how um, how she spoke about these things and how she really wanted change. And in 1956, she was one of the leaders who read out the closes of the Freedom Charter, the Congress of the People. And the Women's March on 9th August was one of the most memorable moments of her very, very colorful political career, as she was one of the main organizers of the protest. She was also arrested on a charge of high treason in December of 1956, and then banned in 1957. Um, the rest of her life really became her fighting police and just her being on trial. Um, and she was also the first person to be placed under house arrest in 1962. And she survived several assassination attempts, including bullets shot through her bedroom window at night and a bomb wired to her front gate. She unfortunately passed away on December 25th in 1992 in Johannesburg. But how, uh, how, influential do you have to be for government to try to silence you by ordering hits on your life so many times and failing um, the revolution is still alive the next person we then look at is Rahima Musa and she was just again like I just really want to draw attention on how ordinary these these, these women were. She was a shop steward for the Cape Town Food and Cannings Workers Union, and she was a member of Transvaal Indian Congress and helped organize the 1956 Fedso Women's March and member of the ANC. And she was born in the Strand, Cape Town, in 1922, where she attended Trafalgar High School in Cape Town. And as a teenager, she she and her identical twin sister became politically active after they became aware of the unjust segregationist laws that ruled South Africa. Much like all of us here, we are pretty young and we are now activists because we see just how unjust our society is. And now we fight for something that we believe in. Um, she went on to become a branch secretary for the union and more active and was more active in labor politics. In 1951, she married Dr. Hassan Musa a fellow comrade and treason trialist. In 1955, she played a significant role in the organization of the Congress of the People where, Freedom Charter, where the Freedom Charter was adopted. In 1956, while pregnant with her daughter, she helped organize the Women's March under the auspices of the Federation of South African Women. And before passing away, she made it a point that her children would continue her work for a just South African society. Her children have since been active in the ANC and her husband, though old, is also active in political work. I like to think of all of us as being children to these people, these people who really fought for um, a just society and people who fought for a world where we could freely engage in activist um actions and not necessarily have to go on trial for it um, so they they really did fight for a better society um, and then we look at Sophia Williams who is the last of the leaders of um, the march that we're going to look at for today and she was an executive member of the Textile Workers Union in Port Elizabeth, a founder member of the South African Congress of Trade Union, full-time organizer of the Colored People's Congress in Johannesburg, and a leader of the 1956 Women's March. She became the founder member of the South African Congress 
of Trade Unions, which is now um, known as the Congress of South African Trade Union, which is also COSATU. The trade union work interacted with mainstream political movements of the day. We also know that a lot of trade union work is fundamentally political. So this is no surprise that a lot of her work um, interacted with mainstream political movements, such as the African National Congress. The Congress Alliance, Indian Congress and the ANC at the time was grappling with issues such as the Group Areas Act, Separate Development Act and the Bantu Education Act. All these um, being acts that were imposed on people who were not white, um, like, you know, Kali mentioned earlier, as a means to further segregate, but also particularly with the Bantu Education Act to make sure that whoever was going through the Bantu Education Act was only to be equipped to become a domestic worker or gardener and nothing that really, really needed them to take up space and essentially mix in a professional setting with um, white people at the time. And it was then that the Colored People's Congress was formed. In 1955, Sophia was appointed as a full-time organizer of the Colored People's Congress in Johannesburg. She is a member of the National Executive Committee of the ANC Women's League and is a member of the Saki Bartman Reference Group. And again, like I mentioned earlier, these were just ordinary women who decided they'd had enough with um, the government and how unjust the society was and also how all these things were just being imposed on people and there was a lot of oppression going on and they decided um, there's no way they could live like this and so they really paved way for um, women to start taking space in a lot of different settings but also to send a message that women could and women have been um, since then. I also take a pause here for any contributions and questions and um, everything of the sort. So the floor is open. Also just um, having time in mind. Five more seconds until we move on. <laughs> yes, Petrus. Sorry, I just wanted to add, um, I think you spoke about um, the Bantu Educa Education Act and how um, um, Native Africans were only equipped with just enough for them to um, mostly get, especially with um, Black women, colored women, to be um, thrown into domestic work. I'm actually doing my thesis um, on the occupational structure of Black women in South Africa. And even till this day, Black women, colored women are mostly found in domestic services. So it's, I think, um, it's, it's incredible to see how, when people speak about, it's been how many years since independence, let's get over it, apartheid's over. It's incredible to see just how long lasting those effects are and how um, and until this day, um, people are still put in these categories or in these groups that um, were designed to keep them um, in these spaces. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you so much for mentioning that. Um, I often say that the peak of apartheid, and this is obviously a personal opinion, um, I often say that the peak of apartheid was, the way I've seen it, was not necessarily to succeed um, during apartheid because it was bound to be toppled, but rather the years that followed democracy, you would really see how apartheid was meant to function and how um, the underprivileged and purposefully ignored members of, co of our society would continue going through um, 
and experiencing what is now called the legacy of apartheid, uh, but really living the realities of what people back then lived in. Um, so that is that is very very um, um, powerful and important to to realize. Uh, and moving on, um, so since the march, we've we've seen um, a number of um, different things. I've I've only put a few things in in here. But we saw that before 1994, the South African Parliament had 2.7 representation of women, which may, which means that if um, the Parliament had 100 people, you would only have two of those people, or two, or three, or that very small number, the representatives of women on a national scale. But post-1994, so after the democratic, the first democratic elections, we saw that the representation of women in the National Assembly um, shot up to about 27.7%. And in 1999, that figure increased to about 30%. Um, where in 2004, we saw that that figure had jumped to 32.7%, which really means that after democracy, um, women could, of course, women have had always wanted to, uh, but they couldn't because of the restrictions of the time. But now that democracy was a thing of the present, they were ready to take up all of these positions and all of this space, and we see it in the statistics, right? And we even see it in the way that society looks like currently. Um, so this is more of what we've seen in recent years. Women have literally started taking up space. The March of 1954 helped open a lot of doors for many, many women, um, including Dr. Nkosaza Natlamini Zuma, who was elected in July 2012 as the first woman in Africa to chair the African Union Commission. Um, and this is just one, and we've also just chosen a handful to really look at and just talk about in today's session. Um, and then next we see that Dr. Pumzi Lemlambo, you'll forgive me with this um, pronunciation, Nguka, Holly? Yeah, it's um, Dr. Pumzi Lemlambo Nguka. She's the former deputy president of the country and was also appointed as the Undersecretary General and the Executive Director of the United Nations Women, um, which is really, really amazing, right? And we've, we've seen so many other South African women, such as Ms. Geraldine Fraser Moleketi, Special Gender Envoy to the African Development Bank, um, Ms. Rashida Manju, Special Rapporteur on Violence Against Women, Its Causes and Consequences, and Judge Navi Pele as the High Commissioner for Human Rights and formerly as a judge in the International Criminal Court, taking up space. Um, and we see that taking up space is an indication of the impact that women in decision making have in winning the trust and confidence of citizens in South Africa on the continent and in and internationally. And we see this also as a legacy of the March of 1956, that women um, are able to, to, to enter these spaces and make waves, essentially. Um, and more on that, we see that women are heading up really important portfolios, but simply just existing in their existence, such as the Commissioner of Police, the Public Protector, CEO of the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, Independent Electrical, Electoral um, Commission, Governor of the Reserve Bank, the South African Law Reform Commission, and the first female Deputy Auditor General, among many others. And these others could simply be... Um, really simple things like teachers and nurses and doctors and engineers and scientists and you know just like things that maybe would not have been imaginable back in 
And um, as we come to a close, um, I just want us to think about how we would like to see more women take up space. Um, I know this is one of those forms that we're doing. This is um, a woman-led space, if you can put it that way, where Kholi and I are more the facilitators. Um, and it, it just really makes us happy to see that women are engaging and you know existing in the spaces that we're existing as well but how would we also like to see more women take up space so that's something that we can think about for a minute um can i just add one more thing michelle i mean patrice brought in a very great perspective of this concept of women being perceived as pillars of strength you know and expected you know to revolutionize um, the world and hide our pain. And I'm wondering, I mean, as women or gender fluid person or a male, um, how do we also want to change the narrative, you know, of women taking up space? Because yes, we are still fighting the same battles, but the times have evolved and surely like, how we move forward should also evolve. So I'm wondering like how, um, if anybody, you know, have ideas of how we can really just find ways to, 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 to begin, you know, to change that narrative of that concept of like, women are strong, women are brave. Um, yeah, it's like what Tinder Buffa is, what Tinder Buffa is like, how do we change that statement? Um, while we think of that, I just want to read some of the contributions that we, we got in the chat. Um, Sarah says, I think what also strikes me when looking at this movement and what and that of so many other successful political movements of the past is the importance and power of multiracial coalition. Absolutely. Then Gabriel says, my late gran was in domestic services until she retired. She stopped working and had no other avenues to work in. Again, just like the realities of, you know, what the system has done to people. Um, but also how important it is to, to, to work together and build the sort of nation we want and the sort of society that we all want to exist in. So if you would like to, Gabriel, yes, please. I think I'd, I'd, I'd like to see more women take up space that is not, and I always you, you like a lot of people are probably tired of me saying it, but for anyone who doesn't know, it's going to sound brand new, <laughs> but in ways that aren't tokenistic, you know, oftentimes it's a, we have women at the table right now, thanks. But like we saw in your presentation now, you know, the way that, you know, ordinary women, so to speak, ordinary in the best sense of the word, um, do great things. And uh, we need to stop this idea that just having women at the table is them taking up space when in fact it should be centered around them and led by them otherwise. Um, so that's how I would like to see more women take up space, uh, especially young, younger women of color. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that, Gabriel. Um, Yeah, and if, if, if also you're a woman and you're wondering how you could take up more space or where to start, um, start where you are. I, I know it sounds very difficult, but literally start where you are. Um, bring attention to the things that matter to you most and then just start organizing join people like most of you who are part of AC already or are visiting one of our workshops for the first time 
these are some of the steps that you can take um, to start talking about the things that matter because people will listen and you just have to step into that space because it's yours to claim already. Petrus? Yeah, just to go off um, what Gabriel said again, um, this um, women being put at the table, this tokenism that um, is often used to, um, to gaslight women into saying, but you are present, but you do have representation. It's not enough when women aren't given actual decision-making power, when they aren't given actual power and actual agency to enact and uh, to, to exercise um, their voices. There needs to be more platforms and more opportunities for where women's voices are centered and not just in um, avenues that, um, that um, pertain to women. So in places like women's rights, yes, that absolutely women's voices must be centered there but also in um different avenues if we're talking about finance we need women to be able to be on boards we need women to be able um to be like i'm glad that the parliament numbers are up but we need more women in these power structures making actual decisions because oftentimes it's women are um added to fill a quota and there's not there's an actual substantial um power given to them. Um, and then I think another way in which, um, in which um, I want um, to see women take more spaces, just uh, um, allowing space, safe spaces for women to conjugate and just um, be themselves, to talk to other women and relate to other women where they're allowed to be vulnerable, they're allowed to express their, their challenges, their fears, their disappointments, their, their struggles, um, but also their victories to just spaces where women are able to let go and unburden themselves because they, they carry so much. Um, and also just challenging these narratives of um, you are a strong woman, you should put up with this. Just being um, active voices in trying to take away that stigma, take away that expectation that women should be strong, that women should be resilient and um, sort of humanize women, to see women as just human beings, see women as um, ordinary people who um, go through ordinary life struggles and who deserve to be um, respected, deserve to be, um, whose voices deserve to be heard, whose uh, pain deserves attention. It's not just because in a lot of ways, men in this patriarchal society are the ones who are coddled. They're the ones who are taken care of. They're the ones who are nurtured. But um, when it comes to women, women are kind of expected to sort of take care of themselves or um, like, you know, they will get through things on their own. They're fighters. They'll figure it out. But no, women need space where um, to be held, to be allowed to break down and be vulnerable and be um, be quote unquote weak, even though showing emotion and breaking down is not weakness, it's just you being human, just more spaces where women are allowed to just be. Um, and another big thing is mental health, allowing women in these spaces and having them spearhead these um, uh, conversations around mental health, because I don't think it's, um, it's, it's taken seriously enough. If we look at examples of Naomi Osaka and um, uh, Simone Biles and how the backlash that they got from simply saying we're going to step away from um, doing interviews or from participating in these competitions because it's just a lot right now for us and how um, they were sort of seen as weaker for not being able to put up with um, um, the pressures but it's you're just being human you're allowed to, to take breaks, you're allowed to say no. Um, so yeah, it's just really actively ch challenging these narratives. Um, so my comment is just that the how would be not tricky, but in the society that we are currently in, it's hard to be heard. 
and that goes for a, a lot of the issues that have been, I guess, raised from many years ago. And I just hope that we will be able to take up space so that in our government, we will have a separate department of women, a separate department for youth, and a separate department for persons with disabilities. Yeah. Thank you so much, Natasha. You know, I know that we are a bit over time, but really it would be great to hear the quiet voices in the space. And Paul? Yes, go ahead and pull. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you loud and clear. <laughs> Hi, thanks. Um, I mean, for me, nothing new that I would say. I mean, you guys have touched on everything that I think most of us in this space wanted to hear, number one. And number two, um, great to, I don't know, maybe to say that, share a, a common understanding of, I mean, our, cert, our issues that women face, not only in our country, but in our continent to be much more specific. Um, I think the issue with me, no, it's not an issue, but um, just a perspective, it's that it's not that we don't know, or it's not known that women aren't capable and we don't have you know, the ability to do these things. It's just the way that the world is set up, unfortunately. So it's very important to actually have spaces like this, have interactions, engage with younger people um, as a form of motivation, as also a mentorship. Because I think young women, that's young black women to be much more specific, that's what lacks on our end is that they don't, they have these dreams, but they don't have avenues or people that is within close proximity to them to actually have these discussions and actually guide them into, you know, their, their future plans. So having spaces like this and um, as young professionals as well, we need to avail ourselves to the young so that we can try and, you know, be some form of guidance and just understand that it's, Way, it, like it's way bigger than just ourselves. It's a whole community that is involved in our well-being and that which is like that which is what we want. Um, so yeah, I just hope that we can have more of these. My first time on this space, and I really, I'm really grateful to be here. And yeah, I'm looking forward to more talks with you guys. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Paul. I feel like that was a, such a good closing. Um, and if you look at the chat, so many people are agreeing with you. Um, mm. Yes, I mean, that that is definitely our intention, really co-creating um, this young, vibrant space for young people really to connect, to dialogue, to network, um, to form um mentorship relationship so definitely you're welcome um i know that we also have a whatsapp group so if you saw on the chat i think gabriel posted the details but you're also welcome to um pin one of us um yeah thank you and yeah i just thank you so much everyone i mean this was very insightful um yeah i just thank you so much for engaging um and bearing with us with going over time we went our time over seven minutes <laughs> which we, we and, needed to, <laughs> just and Polly, needed to. yes um, just so we don't close um Sika's contribution out um she oh, says yes. she would like to yeah. see women achieve more and that not being a shock to anyone just it being normal i'm just it being a normal person doing big things i would actually love to see a female president like how long will that take Exactly, exactly, you know, just normalizing being in the spaces and not 
making it a big deal that, oh, you're a woman and you're a president. And hopefully in Tsinga, you'll be our first female president, who knows? <laughs> but also hoping that we don't have to wait that long because I know you're still in high school. Um, again, just a big, big thank you to everyone for making today. Also on Wednesday, um, so if this is your first time in this space, what we do, so today is just really breaking down the concept, going back to basic. And then on Wednesday, um, it's where we invite um, some specialists, as we would like to call them. Um, we've also marrying that with lived experience. So, um, so yeah. So on Wednesday we will have the webinar. Um, we will we will have um, some of um, women activists, and I know that. Most of them, they will be from ACA, <laughs> which is very exciting. Um, yeah, so it's really just talking about lived experience and going in depth um, on challenges and what they face on their everyday lives. So please join join us in that, and Michelle will be moderating that. Michelle, do you want to say anything more on that? Uh, no, <laughs> just okay. thank you to everyone who's who's made time. Um, and who's really made this space such an experience for us as well. I mean, we we continuously learn every time that we enter into this space, um, we learn, which is why I was saying this is a space for all of us to learn. So thank you guys for um, making, for interacting and making this a very welcoming space for us to sort of exist, but also to like learn. Um, and also thank you for, the time and sacrificing that hour and a half um, and sharing it with us.